Okay, here's a new article that's come out, uh, literally from Dungeons & Dragons itself. You can see in the very top left-hand corner up there. And the article is Diversity in Dungeons & Dragons. And before I get into this, it, it, it tells you it's by Wizards of the Coast. This is the people or the parent property that owns it now. It used to be Wizards of the West Coast, uh, Gary Gygax and the people that came up to it. It's been bought out and rebought back and things through times so don't need to go through all of that really um, whenever I play my video game it's attached to this and there's been a company licensed to end up making the incorporated stuff that goes into it that goes along with their books that are going along with it and they have modules that they got and it's really not that big of an adventure I mean it, if they really wanted to they could put out quite a few more modules per year but they don't want to swamp the market necessarily. They'd rather go with quantity or quality over quality. But they're also trying to have these um, modules that seem to have a directive and a lean to them, but are open enough that you can use them in an open world setting and put them as you want to. And just by omitting a few things, you can make it into something different slightly. In fact, the game that I play is just slightly different. So notice this picture here that you see in the background is the major hub of Neverwinter. It's actually uh, known as Protector's Enclave, and uh, they've got the whole thing drawn out here. Uh, the only difference really is, uh, and they even have the statue and the little tree in front of it, but there should be a giant world tree right here that's taken over from the spot of it, but it just depends on it. And of course there's thunderclouds coming. And that's the way they make the area look whenever the Siege of Neverwinter is starting. So that's pretty cool too. And uh, the only weird thing I guess is where we are standing. Where we are apparently standing is a little below the level of the Moonstone Mask. And it is floating rocks that they've built, you know, a club on and things like that up on the top of that little building there. And you, you can teleport up to it and go down. And it's a pretty cool view whenever you come down into the the city itself but I talk about Dungeons and Dragons a lot in my studies videos because there's so much that has to do with it if you've hung with me for a while it's got to be over a hundred examples been given and in just me telling you something uh, you could probably see it and if anybody's you know you, you don't have to be playing Dungeons and Dragons to understand the idea of Dungeons and Dragons it fits under the guise of what we would think of in our mind as Conan the Barbarian and things that all fit under that realm. All the way from something like Templars and King Arthur even, and plate mail, all the way back to a time that leads into the last ice age. And You can go with Viking type deals and everything. I've even done things over Egypt, ancient Sumerians, which is where I put Conan the Barbarian at. And... Uh, so there's all that going on, right? And so let's get into this, why they feel they need diversity or something here real quick. We'll just go into that rather than me rambling long or longer. Dungeons and Dragons teaches that diversity is strength, for only a diverse group of adventurers can overcome the many challenges a D&D story presents. Well, that's true, but they could all be the same race. In fact, quite often they are. Uh, but... Um, are a few select choices. In fact, a lot of times in the games there will be certain preferences given to certain things like uh, your attributes that you have, a strength and dexterity and so on, and certain characters will get that. And if that's needed for magic, then you'll make that person into a magician and he would probably be the better magician. The healer would go his own way. The strength and stuff works with a barbarian or with a fighter type of person, but strength doesn't necessarily work with a archer or like a hunter that I use and stuff he's using dexterity as his ability to pull off and do harder crits and things like that although they folded that in the game and tried to make it all uniform recently and now everybody uses strength for extra uh, damage and all these type things and screwed it up kind of uh, really I was able to uh, and just on a whim I was able to take my HR which at this point, this was when dexterity was so hot, and I had a dexterity belt on that gave me plus four and a neck that gave me a more plus two on it, so I had plus six and 
the highest attribute I started out was with it, and it got a plus two to it too, right? So wham, and I'm a drow elf, and so it's kicking, but I found out they were going to change it and everything off of it. They did. It really sucked. I tried a few different things, and I'm like, I'm just going to have to pump it back into my strength, and I switched him. Uh, less than a week later, I tried to do it with my Scourge Warlock, and no longer could you re-roll them in any way. And uh, so th they're talking about in here, by the way, where they're going to give you the ability maybe to re-roll it, but they act like they took it away because that was racial preferences with certain races doing certain things, and they wanted to take that away, which really is what made it unique in the first place and not just bland, where you can go, well, I'm an X fill in the blank healer, and this, that, and the other, there would be certain ones that would be preferred. And you had a couple of choices there, but you wouldn't want to do the other ones. Well, they want to make it to where you want to do everything. You might want to do a halfling barbarian that's a cleric, you know, or something. And it's like, well, you could easily, but you'd be missing out on two points. So you surely couldn't be the best, you know. So it requires a diverse group because you need a healer you need a tank he draws the aggro and while he can take more damage and he's wearing the plate mail type of armor and everybody starts trying to beat on him everybody's killing those people and they have combat advantage on him facing away from him all these things happen and they've got it built into the game but um in that spirit they say making D&D as welcoming and inclusive as possible has moved to the forefront of our priorities over the last six years. I don't know if you saw it, but I just made a video where they, they've been doing it for seven years now, and they act like they've been doing this for six years, and it makes one wonder, is that the reason they've been coming out with wonky material, is all for this SJW freakout thing? Surely not, but they just said they did. We'd like to share with you what we've been doing and what we plan to do in the future to address legacy D&D &D content that does not reflect who we are today. Well, I don't, I don't understand that. Uh, legacy content is something that's been around for a long time and it should continue to go on through. And this is a reflection, by the way, I don't know if you saw my recent video on We Was Orcs. But there came out this thing that the description of orcs made it sound like black people. And everybody threw this fit about it. It said that they uh, couldn't create a civilization, tried to take it from others, move in, cause this havoc, and then um, slowly turn their place into a slum and then move on. That they weren't real intelligent and uh, subject to aggressiveness and all this type of stuff. And, well, well yeah, that's... You have to have something you want to fight, and it's, if they're running around and, well, these people are bad, what do they do? Well, they pick flowers, and, you know, it's not going to work. You want to have this Dungeons & Dragons, Willow type of concept going on with it, and, of course, there has to be magic and all these type of things, and there has to be a plight, a thing that you have to ha save. It isn't always saving a princess in the tallest tower, but I've definitely done that quite a few times, but... There are other things that you can definitely do that equate to that, like plights of Lord of the Rings and things that you go through there that really aren't quite that. Though there is a princess in that, and there's a tall tower. So, reflect who we are today. Um, well, d d is a game that's been around forever, and it shouldn't just suddenly be changed or whatever in fact it really can't be because it all works off of mythological lore and things like that and it's really about you know proto-indo-europeans to europeans through the holy land if you will and times of old and lore and all these things that go along with it all around the mediterranean and into egypt and things but it doesn't involve sub-saharans and it doesn't involve Orientals really either, but there are Oriental campaigns, and I've done a couple. Yeah, and there are adventures you can go on where you would meet Islander people, and yeah, they're somewhat primitive, and you have things that go along with them, and they're, they're fighting against this thing, and they can't deal with it, and you come to find out it's a bad guy trying to do this thing and lock them in, and you have to destroy it and save the people.
it's kind of like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom where the people are all screwed and he, he needs to go to Paincott Palace and bring back Shibalinga. You do something like that and bring it back and everything. And ah, and what do you get? Well, you get experience points and all this other stuff. And, you know, maybe a little bit of lore written about you. Bard sings songs about you and you go on. But as you do this, just like the movie Indiana Jones, you end up can pretty much make a movie out of it. And because your group has made the decisions, it's a unique thing. Regardless of whether it had a narrative that goes through A, B, C, D, F, G or not. And quite often in... in the ones that I build and I've been attached to, you can pretty much free world it. But, you, you know, the reason my free world was built because I already set up a whole bunch of adventures. And no matter where you go, here it is, and then there's a table of encounters. You know, you roll, if you're on a one or an eight, here you go. So, and then, of course, the D&D &D just, the D dungeon master just chooses which ones he's going to do. But we recognize that doing this isn't about getting to a place where we can rest on our laurels, but continuing to head in the right direction. We feel that being transparent about this is the best way to let our community help us continue to calibrate our efforts. So apparently they're wanting somebody to go around and critique them if they think anything's a racist. Isn't it disgusting that the world has gotten to this point that people feel like they have to act like that? Yeah, and, and, and just in a time whenever we all thought it was supposed to go away, there are these people that are stoking the fire because they don't want it to go away. Right. One of the explicit design goals of the fifth edition, which is the newest edition of D&D, &D, is to depict humanity in all its beautiful diversity by depicting characters who represent an array of ethnicities, gender and identities, sexual orientations, and beliefs. Well, um, no, uh, but yes, um, so, mm, okay, let's, let's see if I can get that. They have all these different gods that you can pray to, and whenever you pray, you do the same gesture, but you can have different gods. Well, does it do anything to you? None whatsoever. I mean, everybody gets the same thing from praying, no matter which one they pray to. There's not going to be something where this goes with this, and that goes with that, and only do it at nighttime, or anything like that. It doesn't work that way. So it really doesn't matter. But Salune, which is Luna, which is the moon, like my hunter prays to her and a couple of other guys. I got 19 characters if I go through them and want to pray. But anyhow, um, so you get little buffs from praying from your dear God. And you give this little crown things and you hit the little crown deal and it gives you plus one in your attributes for 15 minutes. And so you want to have these crowns and you want to save them up. And when you go into a dungeon or do something, you want to throw on a crown. So, it's odd that they want to be so all-inclusive. And this is, of course, hedging the idea on what orcs were supposed to be. And people have talked about what orcs are and Lord of the Rings and stuff. And it's like, don't be silly. Please stop. You're comparing yourself to someone is not human. It's a joke whenever you do it. These creatures that you fight in Dungeons and Dragons are not meant to be human. Sure, there's sometimes some witch, lich, a sorceress girl that has minions all after her and everything else, but quite often you're going to fight her war dogs and all these other things, and they put animals into it, you know, griffins and we, you know, all this stuff, unicorns people. It's a mythical land made out of folklore, of ancient folklore. And it, uh, it's really about European folklore, but watch what they are about to say. So, we want everyone to feel at home around the game table, to see positive reflections of themselves within our products. Human in D&D &D means everyone, not just fantasy versions of Northern Europeans. And the D&D &D community is now more diverse than it's ever been. Oh, sure, there are actually some black nerds now, believe it or not, that are playing D&D. &D. But there are a lot of them that like to play video games. In fact, some of them are well-known that are playing video games, even Neverwinter. One of the major content creators, Nova, I rode around with for a while, and it became a thing. There was three or four modules in a row there when we finally got the dungeon opened up, and we tried to get into it. Both of us were going into the dungeon together. I've got, you know, I've got it 
copied or whatever. But and uh, he was playing a scourge warlock. I'm playing the hunter, but yeah. and uh, it also happened too whenever I brought on my paladin. But way back in the day. But uh, that's neither here nor there. And they can make they they make it to where you can adopt somebody's face and you can change their hairstyles. And you can change the color of their skin all the way from a light tan to a chocolate bar kind of color if you want to. And you don't want to really go chocolate bar. you got to go a little bit lighter than that. So whenever they turn their face and stuff, you get to see the shine off of it and the things. And so, you know, it's really you know, chocolate bar, mahogany almost, all the way down. And you can do that to it in hairstyles. Of course, you don't want to pick a hairstyle that's going to be a Caucasian hairstyle. Then that would be kind of weird while you were doing that. But listen... In reality, when people play this game, over a third of them actually choose girls, even if they're a guy as a player. And some of the girl players choose guys as a player. Yeah, they wondered why this is, and they go, well, I'm looking at her backside fighting people and everything. Might as well choose a woman, especially if all the stats are the same and it doesn't matter. And they're not giving them a strength bonus for males or anything like that, you know. And it's always been that way in the game, or they wouldn't have women players and so on. They distinctly decided that they were going to make it to where a woman warrior could be the same thing, and we talk about Amazons and all this, blah, blah, blah. Valkyries, if you ever mess with them, are not to be messed with. They'd be like the Amazon's Amazon. But um, human in D&D &D means everyone not just fantasy versions. And no, it doesn't. I mean, you can play as orcs and then you would be a non-human class. In fact, they have weapons that are versus non-human classes, weapons that give pluses versus human classes, and so on like this. And that's a good weapon to have because it's not just first orcs or this, that, and the other, but non-human classes. What is non-human classes? Well, it depends on your DM, but you can have it to where it says, well, it's, it's hurting orcs and everything and vampires. Well, vampires take magical weapons plus one or above. Yes, but this is, he's a non-human, he's an undead. Does it work versus undead? A lot of DMs would say no. But what about animals? It's a non-human. Might work versus them too. So you can have bonuses that are working versus these creatures, not versus those. And you figure it in when you roll up your damage each time you roll your hits and stuff like that. It's not a game that's like people think of at all. It's quite nerdy. But it requires... Uh, you know, being able to fantasize and having a lot of insight on things and puzzles and trying to figure things out and that type of stuff. And that's where the joy of the game is. And the fact that you're a group doing it, it kind of feels like a book. And you're sitting there doing a book, reading a book, kind of, while you're in the book. It's kind of what I thought was neat about it. And I talk about this a lot and everything, but it's not like I played D&D &D forever. I'm in my 50s now, and I've spent seven or eight years of my life playing D&D &D total out of all of it. But I play a game, and I've played this game for ever since it's been out, too. So you got to add that onto it and call it 15 if you want to. But I haven't been rolling dice playing this game. That happens on a computer to hit chance. <coughs> it's all different <coughs> but that doesn't mean that this game has to be in any way inclusive if you play NBA games I'm, I'm not sure if 50% or 64% of the people are black and they have some Asians and some Mexicans on the team too you know 64% white 12.6% black or whatever and go with that are we, are we going to go there because if we go there then you go there and if you don't want to go there because that's not reality, then don't try to go there because this isn't reality. It's a fantasy that's already got its ways situated. Batman's a Caucasian. Superman's Caucasian. The biblical people are Caucasians. The Egyptians used to be blue-eyed Caucasians. Some blonde and red-headed. From the pre-dynastic. All around the Mediterranean, too. They have these ancient stories. The Iliad and the Odyssey and all this type of stuff. And ancient tales of Sinbad and all these things, it all goes together. And it's all part of this Dungeons and Dragons game. And if you wanted to involve 
sub-Saharans, it they wouldn't like it, and you probably shouldn't do it. You have to make up a fantasy Batiri people, and be fighting them in some kind of thing, and it still comes across as well. That sounds very much. It's coming off as very much. I mean, these people lives in huts, and they do this and they that. They they don't have any. Yeah. The Batiri, you can even get a war mask for them. Oh no. Well, if you look at a Batiri, they're really a type of halfling. And that doesn't mean mulatto. That's more like Bilbo Baggins. But one from a land far, far away that actually has dinosaurs in it and other creatures and stuff. And they're going through a big old problem. We ran a big event through there. Let's continue so I can go. Throughout the... Uh, 50-year history of D&D, some of the peoples in the game, orcs and drow being two of the prime examples, have been characterized as monstrous and evil, using descriptions that are painfully reminiscent of how real-world ethnic groups have been and continue to be degenerated, uh, denigrated. And uh, I tell you, that's pitiful. That's pitiful that they're trying to make that comparison. It's like, oh, so when you say you're having to fight the drow, you're killing... No, 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 no. Drow have long, straight hair. Drow are elves that lived underground, and they do this and they do that. And in some of the modules, there are bad people. I play a drow in some of the modules, like even in the game I'm playing, there are good people that are having a civil war, and the reason they were bad before is because of these people that are the bad guys that have infiltrated them and led them astray. And you've got to help them back out. Yeah, Dritz Duarden is a major player in all this, and he's definitely a good guy. I wouldn't say he's necessarily lawful good, but he's he's right there. So, um, so that's not that's just not right. They say, and it's something we believe we believe in. Oh, it's not something they believe in. They don't, they don't believe that orcs and drow are prime examples of this. And of course they're not. They're just made-up creatures. You know, if we made up dragons and everything, do you think lizards should be running a rally? Lizards are like, man, you're making us into this creature. I don't want to go there. I've made videos about where the origins of dragons come from and concepts. But all of this type of lore in Dungeons and Dragons comes from that. If you want to know the reality of it all, dungeons, a donjon, D-O-N-J-O-N, is just a pit in the ground usually they throw people into, and you're lucky if they fed you and you get a chance to go back out. Sometimes you'd be held in ransom and stuff. Not no tallest tower, deepest little hole. And it wasn't hooked up to some giant network of stuff that led to treasure either. That would be foolish, and it wouldn't work out that way. Whenever you're doing that, that's more like of looking through ruins and archaeology. And finding, oh, the tale of Gobekli Tepe, but somehow when you bore down into it, there are rooms you can go into and excavate stuff out. So, you're pretty much a looter, and I've often thought by looking at this, that this, oh, that explains why there's a lot of looted places back in the past, was because of Dungeons and dragons type people. Well, in reality, it was just normal people doing things, which could go on that Indiana Jones concept, and looted things for money long long times ago and that's why we don't have the neat things that we need they have in fact if we didn't have gobekli tepe buried you can imagine that that would have been absconded by somebody a long long time ago and utilized in something else that you would never have recognized again and we would have never known it existed right like all the pyramids that i say are supposed to be unfinished but they took all the stones out of those making the other ones and the other monuments that they made. Well, that would say that some of those were around. Yes, that would too. It would pretty much point to that, wouldn't it? Anyhow, despite our conscious efforts to the contrary, we have allowed some of those old descriptions to reappear in the game. No, it's not reappearing in the game at all. It's always been the description of orcs, and in every module, it's not been changed. And... It's only real, real recently that somebody's pointed out, and I want to mention that this whole waffle cert thing and D&D &D now and everything, it's all done by white nationalists trying to make a big stink. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, you have to check it out. But if you'll look, uh, 
in the new city in Seattle they got. Antifa's all up in that too and stuff. And so there are things that are infiltrated and really they look like they're just getting black people's faces taken off of everything from cream of wheat to waffle syrup and uh, Uncle Ben's rice and all kinds of things like that because isn't, you know, and, and they can get black people wired, wired up very easily over anything like this, especially right now. So we recognize that our live, uh, that to live our values, we have to do an even better job and uh, handling these issues. If we make mistakes, our priority is to make things right. Here's what we're going to do to improve. Well, man, if they spent this much effort in trying to improve the game like people have been begging them to do for years, you know, well, recently here, a few months ago, somebody new got it, okay? New got the lead on it, and they're supposed to be helping that endeavor. And we realize now we've become cultured so much of a game, it's kind of turned into a different game, okay? But he's supposed to be taking it to a new level. In Mod 19, this next thing that we're coming into is supposed to be the first thing that he had a touch on the end of. But then from then on, we'll have that. One thing I have a problem with is it's a extreme delay between each module coming out. And so you end up getting, modules end up getting old, people start playing other games and so on. And it's hard to get some to come back. But it's stretching them out and we're, we were getting four modules at least per year and some of these had a B where after you did all of A for a while they'd throw out a new thing with another thing with a B part in it that, no that's not considered now they're considering B's to be working as a A if you will and only putting out about three in an entire year I mean it's been months since the last one came out and uh, it's been some interesting places but it's, it's, it's slow to come to it, but they've also got people working on Magic the Gathering, which is another problem they're probably trying to combat with this too, because Magic the Gathering has gotten hit recently because two of the cards that you use in it, the description on those just kind of doesn't sound right. One of them, uh, like make, when you use it on somebody, it makes you dumb and you have less intelligence and blah, blah, blah or something, and they, and they say, oh, that just that sounds like black people, and it's like, stop it. But no, they can't stop. Won't quit. Won't quit. Won't, 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 can't quit. Can't quit. Is victim. So here's what they're going to do. We present orcs and drow in a new light in our new of the most recent books, Eberron, Rising from the Last War and Explorer's Guide to Wildermount. In these books, orcs and drow are just as morally and culturally complex as other people's. Oh my God, that sounds so condescending. That sounds like whenever Biden said... Uh, the ethnic people can be just as smart as the white kids. Remember that? We will continue to uh, that, do our, that approach in our futures book, portraying all peoples of D&D &D in relatable ways and making it clear that they are as free as humans to decide who they are and what they do. Even the bad guys, huh? Even the non-human characters, you're not gonna, you're not gonna make them stupid and brutish anymore. No one, is, is this like National Geographic where they're going to quit talking about primitives even though they still exist in South America and Africa to this day? Yeah, National Geographic used to be famous for showing you things like that to where somebody could go, wow, we're going into space over here with these Caucasians and wow, and Erie and Jaya and the people that live in places and Kind of, it was neat because show you this place, but don't go to this place. Why? Don't ruin those people. We've learned a lesson. We should have never ruined the black people. Or, well, not us, the uh, Jewish slave masters and Islamic slave trade 900 years before that. But that's not what this is about. But that shouldn't have happened. Because look what happened afterwards. Well, mainly because they didn't go back. They didn't send them back. Lincoln was going to send them back, but they didn't. Let's get off of that. When every D and D book is reprinted, we have the opportunity to correct errors so that we are the broader D and D community discovered in that book. Each year, we use those opportunities to fix a variety of things, including errors in judgment. In recent reprintings of Tomb of Annihilation and Curse of Strahd, which both of those I've gone through uh, with this game here I play, for example, um, we changed the text that was racially insensitive. Those reprints have already been printed and will be available in the months ahead. We will continue this process for viewing each book as it comes up for reprint and fixing such errors where they 
are shown present. So, um, wow. So everybody needs to buy the old modules real quick before they change it because really the problem that they're, oh, oh my God, check this out. They have this gypsy storyteller. She's a fortune teller and she uses tarot cards and it kind of depicts a gypsy as a gypsy just like in the uh, ancient uh, movie you might be aware of, The Wolfman. And she talks to him and she goes, by the full moon and da da da. And she talks to him, it's all mysterious. Yeah, this is that pretty much that same scenario. In fact, how you get to this town is you hook up through them and they don't want to tell anybody it's a secret. They come through a fog with you and you come back out, you're in this place, right? And in reality, in D&D land, you're supposed to be kind of trapped there. And if you go to the fog, bad things happen. So you're trapped there until you fix the problem and then the fog goes away. Look, Leopold, the fog's rolling in. Yeah, and so I've shown you this with some of my videos about Strahd, and it's really a vampire and all that stuff, and that doesn't have anything to do with ethnics in any way, shape, or form either. Yeah, just like the original concept of the Bible was all Caucasians, Caucasian land. Right. So, um, they want to reprint the books and fix errors where they think there might be in ones. That's pathetic. Like nobody was looking at it before and thinking anything. Later this year we'll release a product not yet announced that offers a way for a player to customize their character's origin, including the option to change the ability score, increases that come with being an elf, a dwarf, or one of D&D's many playable folk. This option emphasizes that each person in the game is an individual with capabilities all their own. And I tell you what I was telling you earlier, that is the strangest thing. Because the only thing that I can find that they might have taken out that was racial in the game was that, that exact same thing. To this day in my game, the Dragonborn race is probably pretty much blanket the best to have. It'll cover you in any way, shape, or form. There's a couple of exceptions. But other than that, too, if you, like I said, if you wanted to be a wizard, then you probably choose this or that. Like I have a tiefling that's a scourge warlock. They go together real good because of their natural bonuses they get a pluses. Whenever you roll your, each one of your attributes up, it gives you a plus in those ones. So you can turn a 16 to an 18 real quick. And if your two major attributes become good numbers for you and you get to throw a couple of points on there, ta-da! And that's what they were talking about, maybe. It's the only thing I can think of in the game that would have done that unless they took out some speech that sounds... But but all, when you run into orcs, they're all, oh, kill you, and, uh, you know, it's, it's the same crap. Curse of Strahd include people known as the Vistani and feature the Vistani heroine Esmeralda. Regrettably, their depiction echoes some stereotypes associated with the Romani people in the real world. Ancient gypsies, hundreds of years ago. But, oh, can't talk about... Oh, no. To rectify that, we not only made changes to Curse of Strahd, but in two upcoming books, we'll also show working with a Romani consultant, the Vistani, in a way that doesn't rely on reductive tropes. Well, it didn't there. In fact, she was the only one that was going to be able to help you save the whole damn thing. <laughs> this is just disgusting. Yeah, she was the secret gypsy lady in the, and the cards... And you came up and she knew you were the ones. Of course, everybody that goes through the game, she says, I know you're the one. But then you play these card things and you have to go through and fight these certain creatures and it gets you to a certain point. And, whenever, and it's all with her. So it's disgusting that they, they've pulled that idea on it. For That's something that, you, you know, right off the bat, if you get this gypsy lady with the hanging earrings and the tarot cards out there and doing things, that just sets it up right there, doesn't it? But they want to try to take the cool out of it. Is that, is that it? That's disgusting. We've received valuable insights from sensitivity readers. What the hell is a sensitivity reader? On two of our recent books, we are incorporating sensitivity readers into our creative process, and we will continue to reach out to experts in various fields to help us identify our blind spots. Now listen, this is not a racist game and none of this stuff is about racist, but let, let's just pretend that they wanted to make a module that was about these people that were enslaving another people and you had to stop those people and help set them free. 
Oh, that'd just be terrible. Well, you can't even mention an aspect like that. Look, white people have been enslaved. Orientals have enslaved each other. Stop it, people. Stop it. Sensitivity readers. Let me say something else. Can somebody right now make a book about KKK stupid? Then is there free speech still in America? Not that they're fr using free speech to say, look, orcs are black people, ha, ha. In fact, it's disgusting that you put yourself in that place. You know, just because somebody was a recent primitive just a few generations ago doesn't mean that any time that, that something is shown in a book or any movie is trying to reflect upon you. It's not all about you. We're proactively seeking new diverse talent to join our staff and pool of freelance writers and artists. No, they're not. Not really. Yeah, you know, well, they may say they are. They may actually do it now. But uh, it doesn't take but a few people to make one of these modules up. Yeah, they'll. you look at them. They'll have a couple of people's names on them. And some of these people have made six or eight modules. And these other people have made six or eight modules and stuff. They're famous in D&D. They've been doing it all their life. They're introved in it. It's your boom. And they make good modules. People like them. And there's nothing racist about it. We will continue to listen to you all. We created 5th edition in conversation with D&D community. It is a conversation that includes continues to this day that's at the heart of our work listening to the community and learning what brings you joy and doing everything we can to provide in every one of our books this part of our work will never end we know that every day someone finds the courage to voice their truth that's whenever you know there's a problem whenever somebody says their truth I'm sure you could look it up real quick if somebody tries to start talking about what their truth is versus reality of everyone's truth there becomes problems. And we're here to listen. Oh no. We are eternally grateful for the ongoing dialogue with the D&D community and we look forward to continuing to improve D&D &D for generations to come. Look, if you put the effort into just, uh, already you can make anybody any color. You can do whatever you want to. You can say they're a black wood elf if you want to, although they know exist. Because hells don't exist. It's just a secret here. I've got to let you know. But elves aren't black people. The Egyptians weren't black people. The biblical people weren't black people. All the stuff in mythology that comes from doesn't. If you want to add it in there, you're going to be adding in primitives. And then that's going to be like okay and now you go to National Geographic land if you want to change it and make it into a lie like Wakanda or some kind of idea too that would also be disgusting wouldn't it this kind of crap's got to end I mean it, it, it's shoes and Gillette and next thing you know it's cereals and waffles, waffle syrup, rice dishes and things. Wanting to take down statues of people that are supposed to remind people of where to never go again, but they want to take it down because they want to go there again. They want to go there. And they don't like reality, so they want to take it away. And that's also, in my mind, not acceptable. We've dwelled in reality all the way till now. There's no reason to go into cartoon circus all of a sudden, is there? Let me know what you think down in the comments, and not necessarily just about this, but about the cartoon circus that you currently see going on. And Anyhow, hmm, I wonder if they would just devote that much extra into trying to fix the game and the glitches that we have in the game if it would be that much better and that's the electronic game I'm talking about that you can play it's a free to play game free to play <clears throat> lots of black people play it dude my guild for a long time and I were running mates 
Yeah, got milk. Straight up. Didn't have a problem with any of this crap, either. Cool dude. He quit playing, though, on and off a couple of times, and then I haven't seen him in two, three modules at least. I think he got on about three modules ago and tried to get his stuff going and chatted to me one time, and then where'd you go? They kicked him out of the guild because of non-showing up. If you don't show up every once in a while in the guild, they'll say you're a non-player, and they kick you out of it because more people are trying to get into it. Since the game folded a little bit, there's been a lot of guilds that have folded and gone into other guilds and f keep filling them back up. Not too many people are making brand new guilds as they were when all this started, of course. Anyhow, let me know what you think about this and all this gotta try to ruin everything you've got because it's racist if it doesn't include me. Peace.